And so we come uh, to the final panel, uh, the final panel of the day, Could not be more vital. which uh, appropriately uh, is on the state uh, and the politics of inequality. And this, of course, uh, is a topic that has surfaced uh, numerous times in different ways uh, in the course of the day. Um, my name's Bruce Weston. Uh, I'm in the sociology department at Harvard. Uh, our panellists today uh, are Jennifer Hogshield, uh, who's a professor of government and African American studies uh, at Harvard, Ira Katz Nelson, uh, professor of political science and history at Columbia, uh, Loic Vacant, uh, professor of sociology at Berkeley, and uh, Theda Scotchpole, professor of government uh, at Harvard. It, this is a, truly a stellar panel. I really couldn't uh, think of uh, a better group of uh, people. Uh, to address this topic, and we'll begin with Jennifer. Well, I want to join the long list of people in thanking Bill for this book and everything else that he has represented for many, many years of my career and all the rest of ours. Um, I will only say that my probably most one or two inspirational moments in talking with him actually had to do with my own work rather than his. So I will spare you the details, although that doesn't, isn't meant to undermine the truly disadvantaged. It's, meant, it's simply meant to suggest that he is as generous about other people's ideas and work and possibilities as he is profound in his own. So thank you. I'm going to start, uh, unlike many of you have started with a quote or a passage or some element of the truly disadvantaged, I'm going to start with a quote from Sandy Jenks in last week's Boston Globe, uh, where he says that the presidential candidates, or maybe the country as a whole, is paying about as much attention now to the poor as in the early 1960s, before Michael Harrington wrote The Other America. Now, as a direct quote, if either presidential candidate plans to address poverty, they clearly expected to do, do it below the radar. Uh, that seems almost exactly right. Uh, Romney mentioned the poor once or twice in his, in his speech. Obama has mentioned them once or twice. This is not to say there haven't been policies around poverty in the Obama administration. Um, I completely agree that there have been, and they're terribly important. But the substantive discourse around poverty and appropriate policies and appropriate politics more or less doesn't exist. I will just remind everybody what we all know. The poverty rate is over 15% at this point. Uh, which is where it was in 1965, 1982, and 1993, according to census data that I looked at the other day, which is to say that it has gone up and down and up and down and up and down. It seems to me all of our discussion of both policies, explanations, politics, has to account for both rises in poverty levels and declines in poverty levels. Uh, and I think we've paid a lot of attention to the terrific problems um, of the truly disadvantaged, entirely appropriately so. But we need to pay attention to when those problems seem to alleviate as well as when they seem to get worse. Um, so part of what I want to do today is kind of remind us that there are policy and political efforts to solve problems of the desperately poor as well as retreats and ways of ignoring them and the kind of thing that Sandy's pointing out. Uh, so what, let me talk a little bit about policy choices and then a little bit about the politics uh, behind policy choices and about where I, and, and a sort of a, and make another point which I won't try to characterize because I'm not sure what phrase to use. So there's lots of ways of thinking about policy, of sort of very broad questions about how to think about the policy choices that one might use to try to alleviate the problems. I'm really thinking now kind of the second half of the truly disadvantaged, more the kind of the consequences rather than the causes. So, and, and many of those have arisen today or in the discussion last night, but you've seen them over and over from our fabulous panelists. Um, so we could talk about various topics, housing, schools, health care, employment, criminal justice system. You could probably add foreign policy. You could probably add immigration, certainly, a dozen other things. And that's one way of thinking about the policy arena. Uh, a second way to think about the policy arena is also that's come up is kind of a place-based focus. Let's think about particular locations, neighborhoods, communities, cities, states, and think about the ar array of policies necessary to engage fully with all of the complicated interlocking problems in a particular geographic location. Third way to think about policies uh, is around questions of incentives, either for individuals or for corporations or for organizations or for some larger entity. 
as compared perhaps with mandates or requirements, as compared with, perhaps with structural changes that people aren't even necessarily aware of but turn out to have an impact on the way they live their lives, as compared with perhaps cultural exhortation or religious revival or something like that. So there's an array of policy choices that have to do with the kinds of tools one uses. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of those. Um, instead, what I want to talk about is, a, is a, an old but I think venerable and useful distinction between essentially targeted and universal policies. Uh, targeted policies, as we all know, are aimed at a particular population. In this case, it would be the truly disadvantaged. Uh, in my view, it would be a racially inflected kind of targeted policy because I do think that we've got lots and lots of evidence that what is going on with a disproportionately poor black population in inner cities is different than what is in general going on with other populations. But there could be targeted policies aimed at a bunch of different particular uh, precisely defined populations. Um, single mothers, ex-felons, undocumented immigrants, people with physical or mental disabilities, uh, people who have less than a high school education, you can pick your target in a whole bunch of different ways. The alternative, of course, are universal policies aimed at a broad swath of the population uh, which can be targeted within universalism to use Theda's, I think, wonderful, I think Theda's was the first person to use that phrase, I'm not sure. But in any case, she has a very famous article of a uh, chapter that says, well, you can have a universal policy, but it can have targeting within it. So, for example, Social Security is available for all retirees, but its downwardly distributed payment schedule actually is an anti-poverty program and so on. So there can be targeting universalism, targeting within universalism. Uh, the point that I want to make um, is that we as a nation have, in two important historical eras, done both of those things. Roughly speaking, the 1930s was about universal policies. The 1960s was about targeted policies. That's much too glib and much too simple, and any historian in the room is already cringing, but I'm going to stick with it because I've only got a few minutes and I want to kind of make a broad point about the relationship between kinds of policies. Um, and the point I'm going to make, in case I get run out of time, is that both actually can work reasonably effectively if they're sort of on a large enough scale. And the scale is about politics. It's not about the content of the policies. So that's the point that I'm going to try to get to in a few minutes. Um, and there is, as I say, another point that I want to get to if I, if I have time. So the 1930s. Um, again, kind of think back to your Wikipedia knowledge or your high school textbooks or your deep historical knowledge if you're a deeply knowledgeable historian. Uh, the 1930s legitimated and facilitated labor unions through the Wagner Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act. It created, of course, Social Security, unemployment insurance, uh, welfare for the children of single mothers who were disproportionately thought of as widows, but it was a, a, a policy broadly for a category of the population. Works Progress Administration, federal employment, the Fair Labor Standards Act, Housing Authority, Public Works Administration, Rural Electrification, TVA, and so on. So that, that's sort of maybe half or two-thirds of this. A very long list of very widely scouted policies, some of which were targeted, welfare, for example, but most of which were designed or at least framed as broadly universal policies to bring the country and the population as a whole out of depression. Um, they sort of kind of worked. Uh, the single biggest policy that worked was a very universal policy called World War II. Um, and you know all of the, uh, the galvanization of the economy that, we, that was required. Um, so we have an era in which we had a very wide array of essentially or mostly universally oriented policies, or at least framed that way. And they had a non-trivial impact on deep poverty and on the country as a whole. Switch now immediately to the 1960s, and I'll do an equally glib and quick run through of some of the policies of the 1960s. I want to argue that these were much more explicitly and intentionally targeted on particular populations. Poverty, African Americans, inner cities. Uh, so there were, again, there were some broad universal policies. This isn't, I don't want to be too glib here, Medicare being perhaps the most obvious one. But if you think about, for example, the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, ESAA, uh, the War on Poverty, Economic Opportunity Act of 1964, the Appalachian Regional Development Act, Job Corps, VISTA, Model Cities, Food Stamps, Upward Bound, Community Action Program, Head Start, Medicaid. Uh, most of that list are aimed either at the black population who are in desperate need of civil rights, voting rights being brought into the community as a real legitimate uh, component of the, of, of the citizenry, or they were aimed at the poor, or they were aimed at cities. And of course, in the 1960s, there's a very strong overlap among those things, but essentially they're targeted policies. Uh, they also had a big impact on poverty. 
Uh, we also happen to have a war that stopped most of the social welfare uh, reform of the 1960s, as we did in the 1930s. Um, and if you look at all the data, we know that black poverty declined. We know that poverty among the elderly declined. We know that the targeted policies, roughly speaking, more or less worked. Uh, again, you want me in much more detail to kind of spell out this argument. Uh, but the point here is that we have two eras with a huge array, a very inefficient policy regime in both cases, in the sense that we had a lot going on in both. It's a little difficult to disentangle exactly what impact any one of them had, uh, but collectively, they can be argued to be the most important set of policy regimes around questions of poverty, the truly disadvantaged uh, African Americans in the second case, not in the first case. Um, so I think the, the distinction, that, so the point I want to make here is that a huge bunch of somewhat inefficiently produced universal policies is one strategy. A huge bunch of somewhat inefficiently produced targeted policies is another strategy. What distinguishes these two eras is that the politics allowed it to happen in both cases. Uh, so that the, what's, what's important here is that we had a political regime in the 1930s, also in the 1960s for somewhat different reasons, of course, that enabled the federal government, or I don't think it has to be the federal government, but it happened to be historically that in both cases, to, to kind of throw everything they could possibly think of at the problem. Quite different strategies, universal targeted, but basically it was a broad political regime that said, we're going to just do whatever we could possibly think of, and congressional politics, presidential politics, public opinion, the Supreme Court eventually, at least in the first case, allowed all of that to happen. Okay, so that's kind of one point I want to make, is that the issue was kind of the politics rather than the right policy choice. Uh, the second point I want to make is a somewhat more uh, discouraging one. Two minutes, okay. Um, that the political will to take big steps with regard to the truly disadvantaged is in some sense undermined by the very fact that, the truly dis that, that we've had a great deal of progress in the African American population and in the country as a whole around questions of wealth, poverty, uh, to some degree, loss, desegregation, and so on. Uh, what we have, so, so the question is kind of what kind of politics do we need to produce these very large policy changes uh, a depression is one answer for the 1930s. Uh, protests and violence is another answer for the 1960s. Uh, we might hope that progressive politics of probably most of the people in this room, perhaps an alliance of people of color. Uh, but the general point is that uh, the better off population is increasingly, I think, removed and distanced from what we might now think of as the truly disadvantaged or what we used to call the underclass. And the more bereft and left out are the people who are not part of the on balance improving population, improving class structure within the black population or within the country as a whole, the more difficult it is to generate the kind of politics that we need in order to promote the kind of policies that occurred either in the 1930s or the 1960s. So what we have is a set of people who are largely left out and a set of people who are increasingly distanced, I think, from the rest of the population. Uh, I have some survey data, but I'll spare you since I'm running out of time. Let me quote instead from a, um, uh, uh, a project that was not my own with Kalila Dean Brown in summer of 19, uh, 2008. Some of my classmates, this is a high school student, are all hyped because a black man wants to be president and my teacher says we should excite, be excited because a woman's running. I mean, it's cool for them or whatever, but at the end of the day, what difference does it really make? Don't neither one of those people care what's going on in my neighborhood. Nobody knows the kind of stuff we deal with. I just want to be heard, to feel like I matter, and the people around me matter. Um, and then he closes with something else, like, which I can't now find. Uh, so Eugene Robinson makes kind of the same point that I'm trying to make. Increasingly, between the what he calls the abandoned and the rest of the black America, there's a failure to communicate, a failure to comprehend. Uh, the worry here is that the politics of the, the very success of some of the programs of, say, the 1960s, makes it more and more difficult to promote the success of the rest of the population. I want to be very careful here. I am not saying that middle class blacks, middle class Latinos, or middle class whites, for that minute, have to have a particular responsibility to shoulder uh, the success of the truly disadvantaged of their own race or group. That seems to be totally inappropriate. Uh, I'm certainly not saying that the United States would be better off if we didn't have an improved African-American or perhaps even eventually Latino population. Uh, 
Uh, it's silly to argue that sort of shared poverty is better than a broader class distribution of the type that Bill talks about in, for example, a declining significance of race. Uh, nor am I saying that whites don't care and that this is something that's sort of only part of the black population and part of the Latino population. We're all here. Uh, some of us are not either black or Latino. Um, but as a group becomes smaller and more isolated, more distinct from the rest of the population, it becomes harder and harder for people to develop a language, for people to understand, for people to set a sense of sharing and engagement that's necessary for the kind of broad political transformation that we saw either in the 1930s or the 1960s. Uh, so I want to close just by suggesting that we need to think about very hard about what kind of politics are going to make a difference. Um, I don't want to be totally pessimistic here. We did, after all, elect an African-American president. We look like maybe we're going to do the same thing again, uh, both with a higher percentage of white voters than for any Democratic candidate since Lyndon Johnson and with a very substantial non-white voting population. So we have a different electoral system than we had certainly in the 1930s, also in the 1960s. Uh, my own research suggests that young adults are much more engaged with each other, much more comfortable about racial and ethnic diversity, much more familiar with the idea that the country is fundamentally mixed in a whole bunch of different ways, and that's perfectly fine. That's the environment they're growing up in. Again, I'm being a little glib here because I'm running out of time. We have a generation of excellent policy research, much of which you've heard described here, uh, that we didn't have in the 1930s or the 1960s. Uh, we have the slow growth of non-Anglo elected officials at state and local arenas who will eventually perhaps have more increasing amounts of influence in their communities and maybe in the nation as a whole. Uh, but I want to end with the question of kind of, we're roughly speaking generationally overdue for another New Deal great society. Um, I don't think the policies themselves are going to matter as much as generating the political will to do the kinds of things that happened during both of those eras. And I don't see it at the moment, so I'll stop there. All right. One of the uh, remarkable features of this day is that each time someone speaks, one is tempted to then enter into a 20-minute discourse about what has just been said. Um, but let me begin, of course, uh, with Bill. Um, I moved to Chicago from New York as a provincial New Yorker in the mid-1970s um, with great trepidation. And um, uh, you were one of two colleagues. The other was David Greenstone in political science, um, whose warm uh, greeting and engagement um, made me know that I had then made the, the right judgment. And the, the colleagueship, the scholarship, the friendship that you've exhibited over the years um, has been an inspiration not just to me, obviously, but to thousands upon thousands. And thank you. Thank you very much. I even forgive you one thing. Um, there was a period when, um, if one called Bill's home, um, one would be told by anyone who answered the phone, not Bill, Bill is not at home. But I knew he was in his basement <coughs> listening to Dr. Julius Irving play, uh, <laughs> play for the Philadelphia 76ers. Is that correct? Um, and I forgive you for that. I even forgive you as a Knicks fan for your uh, enthusiasms. <laughs> now, I'd like to say one set of very brief preliminary things and then focus in my brief remarks on what might be called the social geography of the politics of inequality and race. Uh, the preliminaries go like this. I, we, we talk a lot about race and racism, but I don't think we talk enough about uh, racism as a, what might be called a conceptual, a layered conceptual variable. When I think of racism, I think of five distinctive dimensions and think of the Jim Crow world as one end of a continuum on each of these dimensions. The first is the issue of physical separation, even forced physical separation. Second, a dimension of physical security. Um, think of the Jim Crow South and the uh, and not just the Jim Crow South, of uh, uh, extraordinary insecurity uh, for African Americans in daily life. Um, third is the dimension of, um, uh, of earning a living and restrictions on how one might earn a living. Fourth, um, the character or opportunities for autonomous and open cultural expression of one's own language, culture, um, and the visibility of that culture in, its, in the larger uh, public domain. And last was, of course, the question of civic 
of participation and, and citizenship. Um, in each of those dimensions, Jim Crow America um, said no uh, to African Americans. The revolution in our time has been not that every black person um, enjoys utter freedom in terms of physical movement, physical security, the right to earn a living, cultural expression, or political participation. It is that the continuum with respect on each of those levels and not always evenly for different individuals um, is remarkably wider than it once was, so much so that for some African Americans there are basically, to speak of, almost no, if I don't mean there's no discrimination or attitudinal resistance, but in practical daily life, no restrictions um, on uh, where one lives, physical security, and so on. And for others, uh, perhaps more so than was true uh, 20 and 30 years ago, uh, to use the phrase we were using before, Gene, the, uh, 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 the phrase of a nation within the nation is deeper than it was uh, for some, uh, for a minority, but a, a deep and, and a numerical minority, important minority of African Americans. So why, why is that important? It seems to me it's important analytically that when we talk about the importance of race, we not confuse the levels, um, that we uh, uh, have measures and ways of thinking not only about them separately, but configurations and what difference different configurations make and make in space. Um, which is one of the great points of Bill's uh, distinguished work. And second, I think thinking about race and racism at those different levels um, <coughs> opens up a question uh, that is normative. What would we want um, in America? There's no single answer, but I think for me the simple answer is something um, akin to what Michael Walzer once wrote about in an essay called What Does It Mean to Be an American? In which he said, to be an American means there are two sides to a hyphen, Polish American, Irish American, Jewish American. Um, uh, and on both sides of the hyphen, he said, there is choice about how thick and how deep to make the Polish or the American. You could live in Greenpoint in New York, at least until it was gentrified recently, and be in an area where people only spoke Polish, the signs are all Polish, but they're still Polish Americans. Or you could be Polish, change your name, and nobody would know you're Polish. That's a choice. Um, and how strongly to emphasize, therefore, the American side of the ledger was also a matter of choice. For African Americans, certainly, um, have not lived in that world of choice. And it seems to me the normative goal must be to have an America in which all Americans, including African Americans, can make the choices um, of the kind that Walzer said were open to ethnic uh, uh, Americans. And those choices might include living apart. They might include distinctive cultural expression. They might include thickening the African in the African American, or they might not. And that, until we have that open continuum, uh, racism uh, still reigns, it seems to me. Um, and the, the last, um, well, those are my preliminaries, and I've taken too long. What I really want to say, I want it bring politics and state and institutions into the story in CNN headline news version in three three dimensions. The first might be called the level of democratic participation. The second, the whole, uh, key hallmark of the American political system, separation of powers. And last, the question of federalism. On democratic participation, it seems to me there are two vast changes in the landscape, not just in the last 25 years, but including the last 25 years, but in the last half century that profoundly affect questions of inequality in America. One might be called an absence and the other a presence. The absence are unions. Um, the, in, at the end of the Second World <coughs> War, in the least unionized part of the United States, the American South, almost 20% of private wage workers had belonged to unions. Um, today it's about 7% for the whole country. Um, that's an absence. We can, if we have time, we can talk about the ramifications. No one's mentioned unions today, really. Um, uh, unions were important not only for the obvious reason of giving power to people uh, uh, to earn real wages and the like, but also they were, the unions have been, the, especially the CIO unions, with all their flaws, the single most integrated institution in American uh, public life. Um, and the downplay of that unions uh, produces um, uh, growing segmentation and separation, not just in labor markets, but in daily interactions across the racial um, divide. Um, but the, the presence 
is not just suburbs, which we've talked a lot about, but the politics of suburbs. Um, you go into almost any uh, middle income suburban neighborhood, ranging from lower middle class to upper upper class. The politics has three dimensions. First, it's about real estate values. And second, it's about schools, because they, in part other, among other things, they feed into real estate values. And third, they're about zoning. And zoning's already been briefly mentioned. Um, America is outside of the cities, remarkably fragmented in its governance structure. And the governance structure impels towards the reproduction of inequality. It's one of the most powerful forces of social geography. Reciprocally, and maybe even ironically, even take a city like Chicago, which is very segregated, and has a long tradition of racism. If you look at the politics of the city of Chicago, it didn't matter whether you were representing the city from the black south side or west side in Congress, or whether you're Dan Rostenkowski representing a white ethnic, not particularly friendly to blacks district. Um, when they got to Washington, they all voted for the Great Society. They all voted for the New Deal. There was an urban collective base of a certain kind of politics, which is completely absent in the logic of fragmentation and suburbanization. So the first plea is to think about institutions like unions and about social geography in ways which illuminate the dynamics of politics. Second, and that of course bears just a footnote, one of my old obsessions from when I was younger, um, about the relationships between work and home. And a, a movement politics um, requires bridging work and home. Because if you don't bridge work and home, then work becomes just about what I do when I go in those few hours, and it doesn't become a more general politics. And in the absence of unions that had a national scope, it's very hard for it to burst out of the workplace. Um, and home politics tends to be based on other considerations, um, which often cut against the grain of moving towards more uh, equality. So working across those boundaries and thinking about the institutional <laughs> configurations that make that possible seem to me to be fundamental. Second, um, the question of separation of powers, which brings me to Congress. And I will make such a simple-minded statement about prepared to defend it. Um, the single most important force in shaping policy possibilities in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, in the great society and beyond um, has been the, the partisan location tied to the preferences, including racial preferences, of the 17 states, representatives of the 17 states that mandated segregation before Brown. Um, before 1954, um, and after 1954, um, they were all Democrats. You have um, uh, 34 senators in the United States Senate, not one of whom ever opposed segregation um, before and even after Brown for a long time. Um, they were half or more than half of the Democratic Party. Um, and their limits of tolerance um, for public policies um, defined the scope of so-called universalism, which wasn't quite universal. Um, and it was only in a transitional moment um, with the loss of authority of the South that a variety of changes, including civil rights legislation, was possible. And since the civil rights revolution, we've had the only realignment politically, which is the South, which was once durably democratic, is now durably Republican with fringe exceptions, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida, we know voted for, for, for President Obama, which itself is a kind of miracle. But, the, um, but having said that, the scope of choice in American political life is, remains profoundly determined by what essentially is a one-party South. Um, it was then, it was now, and differently. And I would love to see the kind of um, uh, really sophisticated, um, rich, powerful analyses of uh, demographers, students of poverty, um, the sociology of the politics integrated into this kind of more mainstream institutional understanding of the dynamics of American politics and how the preferences and roll call behavior of people who make the laws actually get shaped and changed. Um, and there, it's not just the movement question, it's the role of interest groups. And as a footnote, it's worth observing that there's been a radical change in the last half century. In, in early 1950s, when uh, people like David Truman and the other pluralists were writing about American politics, what they had to say, um, V.O. Key, they all said, um, 
interest groups, it's rational for them not to decisively choose between one party and the other. They want to, or social movements, they want to have uh, the game in both parties. That's not true today. Uh, today, if I tell you somebody's for abortion or against abortion, I can tell you whether they're Republicans or Democrats. Um, and that's true across the whole spectrum of um, interest groups and, and movements, which have, um, it's a longer speech about why that has happened, but it's happened, and that's the basis, the deepest basis of polarization in American life, of political life, which makes it so hard to deal with poverty and inequality on a national scale. And finally, federalism. Um, uh, it, some of this has been said already, but um, you know, we have local politics, local is urban and suburban, we have national politics, but we have state politics. And it's, uh, state politics tends to be the zone, with the exceptions of the Wisconsin brouhaha and so on, that is least well covered by journalists. Um, New York Times used to have a permit. E.J. Dion was the New York Times correspondent in Albany. Um, you, there's no New York Times correspondent in Albany. Um, <laughs> there, there, there's, we, there's almost zero attention paid in a systematic way to what happens at the state level. And yet, it's at the state level that the most fundamental, um, often the most fundamental decisions are taken with respect to federal programs, uh, income transfers, uh, housing policy, framework for zoning, you can go law, and it's the least visible, it has the lowest participation rates of ordinary citizens, and the poorer you are, the less likely you are to have any sense or any access to information about what happens at that middle level of federalism, and I'll end with a, Chicago, once Chicago colleague uh, Grant McConnell, political scientist who had already left for, uh, for California when I arrived, but who wrote a great, great book on, um, what's the title? Do you remember the Private Power and, uh, and, American, and democracy. American Democracy, in which he argued that, that people at the state <coughs> level always argue, this point was made earlier today, well, um, we're closer to the people than the federal government, um, and therefore, devolved to us, um, so we'll know what's good in Massachusetts and New York and Mississippi. But he pointed out, um, quite apart from issues of race and exclusion, that the, the low information politics of states means that uh, it's there that moneyed interests, that um, uh, uh, concentrated forms of power dominate the politicians in a way that can't quite happen at the immediate local level where there's a lot more direct, tangible knowledge, or at the federal level, where a much brighter light is shining on politics um, as a result of coverage. Um, so my last plea is um, for those of us who are interested in these questions of race and inequality, is to, to give at least somewhat greater attention um, to the dynamics of what happens at the, in the 50 states. Thank you very much. Uh, Loic. Okay. okay. Uh, it's an understatement to say that it's a special pleasure and a distinct honor to uh, be on this panel. Uh, I want to thank the organizers. Um, uh, but more so Beale for being a fabulous teacher, mentor, and friend for, for 27 years and counting. Um, and since I was one of the students who was part of his large research team that, that uh, worked on the Urban Family Life project that became, the, that was the material for the tool advantage, I want to take a couple of ex extra minutes off the clock to, to, uh, to mention uh, that I was one of the many students who was raised on what we call, I'm revealing this to the audience, but I'm also revealing this to Bill. We used to call being on this project, being on Bill Fair. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was raised, I remember that actually. I was yes. raised on Bill Fair, but I didn't do too badly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to just tell you what I learned on Bill Fair. In his Vermischte Bemerkungen, Ludwig Ludwig Wittgenstein writes that when you are trying to think new and difficult thoughts, you have to pay for them. And he asks, what currency do you pay in? <laughs> and his answer is courage. Beale, by example, you've taught us intellectual courage. Pursue the big picture, ask the tough questions, dig deep into the details, turn every stone, and follow through to state your conclusions boldly 
and clearly, even when this means ruffling social, political, and intellectual feathers along the way. 50 years ago, C. Wright Mills gave us a living exemplar of the sociological imagination, and you've given us a living model of sociological fortitude. And for that, I am grateful. Here, here. Now, I am going to need a lot of fortitude to speak about the state in front of these people here, because <laughs> these are the most accomplished scholars on this topic, and I'm sort of entering into uh, this debate through a sort of side door. Uh, but I want to argue in the little time that I have that the state is the missing elephant in the analytic room of the truly's advantage. And that we need to, as Theda urged us, around the time when Bill wrote his book, to bring the state back in, but not in the usual guise of the remedial and reactive agencies that comes to treat poverty and marginality downstream when it is already there. But rather, we need to try to think of the state as a marginality machine as an agency that produces and distributes marginality and poverty upstream. And that within the state, my second proposition, is that we need to pay attention to the penal wing of the state, by which I mean the police, the courts, the prisons, the jail, the prison system, probation, parole, criminal justice databases, and, and their extensions, and so on and so forth. Uh, because the penal wing of the state, or the penal state, to go in short, has come to play a major role both in the production and in the management of the truly disadvantage. Now, I have very little time to argue this, which is essentially sketching an analytical bridge between the truly disadvantaged and my book, Urban Outcast, which was triggered by Bill's uh, scholarship, in which I offer by comparing the trajectory of the black American ghetto to the trajectory of the European urban periphery. I try to offer a diagnosis of the rise of a new regime of urban poverty that supersedes both the ghetto on the US side and the traditional working class territories on the European side, characterized by three properties, that it is fueled by the fragmentation of wage labor, by the retraction of the social welfare state, and by territorial stigmatization. And then in the follow-up, in punishing the poor, I offer an anatomy of the double regulation of this poverty through the converging action of disciplinary social policy on the one side, the shift from welfare to workfare, and, from, uh, and uh, with the extension of neutralizing penal policy, what I call expensive prison fare. But how do I get from here to there? Let me tell you uh, <laughs> how I got uh, to what I tried to do is by trying to answering the question, uh, what makes a great book? A great book is a book, it's a study that rocks the field. Uh, it's a study that animates research and theorizing. And it's a study that raises puzzles and points to new agendas. And I think that this is the part that I want to uh, take up. I want to use the truly disadvantage as a springboard to raise the question, how can we think the role of the state in relation to the truly disadvantaged 25 years ago? And in a sense, one way of, of, of summarizing my reading of Bill is that I think Bill gave us a portrait of the effects, the consequences of the transformation of the state at ground level, at the bottom of the system of places, at the bottom of the class structure, at the bottom of the ethnic structure. What he was observing is the imprint of the shift from the protective Keynesian state to the punitive neoliberal state. Um, now, so we need, but, but to understand that, we need to shift, is it, yeah, so this is really a problem in statecraft we're dealing. But for this, we need to shift gear and look at the how the state produces poverty. To grasp the form and dynamics of urban marginality in the advanced societies today, we must revoke the conventional conception of the state as an ambulance that rushes to the scene of poverty to try to treat it after it's happened, or a service counter that delivers programs downstream. And we must look at the state as a stratifying and classifying agency. Now, stratifying agency, that's something that we learned from uh, Gusta Esping Anderson in his work on welfare. He argues that actually welfare stratifies the society, distributes, uh, lifts, creates a floor, and, and essentially impacts in a major way the span of inequality. And I want to take Gusta Esping Anderson's argument from welfare to the penal wing of the state and argue the penal wing of the state is a stratifying agency. And then I borrow an argument from Bourdieu, who teaches us that universities and especially elite schools are classifying agencies. They distribute labels, they distribute credentials, and they distribute credentials that justify the eminence of the dominant and, and because of their individual merit. And I want to urge you to think of the criminal justice as sort of a negative university that provides negative credentials that will legitimate on grounds of merit here, demerit, the exclusion and the dereliction of those who have cycled through it. So think of the state as this stratifying and classifying agency. And follow me as we're going to go back to the 16th century. Um, and I'm going to argue that essentially the, 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 
the, the prison is, we must think that the prison is not just a technical appendage of the state, but it's really a core political capacity through which the state produces not only material order, but also produces symbolic order. And also stages sovereignty, traces and patrols the boundaries of citizenship. In every advanced society, the good citizen is defined by a triple contraposition to the foreigner, the pauper or the welfare scrounger, and the criminal. So I think Entering into the prison is also a very fruitful platform to rethink the state, particularly as it deals with the poor, because as we're going to find out in a second, the prison has always been an instrument that dealt with the truly disadvantaged from its very origin. And the prison is also a core urban institution. Since its origin, it's been there to manage urban marginality, even though it doesn't figure in the list of canonical subjects of urban sociology. Penal policy has always been a plank of poverty policy and has always been linked to poor relief. And I'm going to make so two arguments. One, we have to look at the rise of the penal state in response and as an element that produces urban marginality. And secondly, we must relink social welfare policy and penal policy and see them as two, the two sides of the same political coin of managing difficult populations and problem territories. So first, we should give Bill his penal props. Uh, and because in, in the truly disadvantaged, he's, he's the first major student of urban inequality to notice long before the ill-named topic of mass incarceration came into fashion that the criminal justice system was having a drastic and dramatic impact on the life chances of inner city residents. In his we, computation... We, we go back to the... Oh, the no, no, uh, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm getting there in a second. Um, he points out when he computes his male marriageable pool, he computes the number of men who have been incarcerated and therefore have been subtracted from the, the men who would be available to form families in the neighborhood. Was he right? You bet he was right. If anything, he massively underestimated the phenomenon. Here is, let's go to North Loundell. This is uh, one of the neighborhoods of the west side of Chicago that I described in chapter four, Urban Outcast. Uh, you see this is a neighborhood with a population of, in 1990, population of 47,000, uh, 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 exclusively black, with nearly half of the population living under the poverty line. The official unemployment rate uh, uh, exceeding uh, 27%, 60% uh, single uh, parent families. Um, in this neighborhood, during that year, the, in, during the year 1999, there were 17,059 police arrests. So, the volume of police arrests exceeded the male adult population. One third of these arrests were for narcotics offense. In three of four cases, this was for simple possession of small volumes of narcotics. Of those uh, 17,000 arrests generated nearly 3,000 local residents who were con convicted and remanded uh, to the Illinois Department of Corrections and sent uh, down in South South Illinois to serve time. And of those, nearly 2,000 were convicted of drug violations and 596 for theft, meaning 85% of the prison intake was for minor violations. Uh, so this leads to the following computation that I gathered from a multiplicity of sources. The number of, of, of black males or the number of males in North Loundale in that neighborhood were 10,500. The number in prison was almost equal. So indeed, what we are seeing there, so we talk sometimes about these neighbors where there's been massive dis disinvestment. Well, there's been a disinvestment and a pulling out of the economic state, and there's been a pulling out of the social welfare state, but there's been a massive investment of the penal state. So um, this led me to this realization, led me to write the article Deadly Symbiosis, in which uh, I show that the upsurge in black incarceration in the three decades after 1973, even as the overall criminal victimization stagnated and the paradoxical blackening of the prison population, even as, white, uh, as, as violent crime was whitening over time, resulted from the collapse of the ghetto as an implement for the socio-spatial containment and economic exploitation of a tainted population. And then this leads us to raise, in a sense, the harder question. Uh, it is, in a sense, why, why did the... Um, so why did the prison, why did the penal state invest so much in these neighborhoods? Um, to explain this punitive turn in penal policy in the US, we need to break out of the crime and punishment box and pay attention to the extra penological functions of penal institutions. Then we discover that in the wake of the race riots of the 1960s, the police, the courts, and the prison 
have been deployed to contain the urban dislocations wrought by economic deregulation, on the one hand, and the implosion of the ghetto as an ethno-racial container, on the other hand, and to impose the discipline of insecure employment at the bottom of the polarizing structure of classes and places. And as a result, we have the resurgence uh, of the prison. Um, and so if we turn to history, this is not very surprising, because this is the history, if you go back to the invention of the prison, you will find that the prison, from its origin in the 16th century, was not an instrument to respond to crime, but it was an instrument to manage marginality, dispossessed and dishonored populations situated at the bottom of the class order, but at the bottom of the status order, that from the very beginning it had a mixed mission, provide relief and discipline, and it was always selectively deployed in social and physical space. Now, um, I'm going to need to uh, zoom, and indeed, if you, if you look at the, at the social profile, of, of jail inmates, for instance, in the United States, fewer than half of them at the time of arraignment held a job. Two-thirds of them came from families living under half of the poverty line. Uh, and 60% uh, uh, had grown up without both parents, including 14% in a foster home. Uh, and then this list uh, makes me come to the second uh, thesis. My second thesis is that to elucidate the new politics of marginality, we must imperatively relink shift in penal policy and shift in social welfare policy, instead of treating them as two separate domains, as is conventional in both the scholarly and the policy debate. The downsizing of public aid leading to welfare reform and the shift from protective welfare to disciplinary workfare aiming to push people in the substandard slots of the deregulated low-wage labor economy, correlative of the shift from welfare to the rights of, uh, so, so from, from welfare to workfare, um, and the upsizing of the prison are the two sides of the same political coin. Together, work fair and prison fair affect the double regulation of poverty uh, in the age of deepening e economic inequality and diffusing social insecurity. And here, I, I'm not going to have the time to go over this, but essentially this is how we can summarize the core of this argument to look at the role of the state in producing uh, marginality. First, you have, so this is the, your neoliberal policy package. Typically, people identify neoliberalism with the withdrawal of the state. No, it's the re-engineering and the redeployment of the state, and in particular, to impose commodification at the bottom. So what you have is economic deregulation, which is a misnomer for re-regulation in favor of firms, but which translates in growing joblessness, growing job insecurity, growing turbulence at the bottom of the class and spatial hierarchy, which creates a lot of social anxiety. Then, typically, the way you dealt with that is you rolled out your social welfare uh, protection. But you can't do that because if you, if you keep the social welfare protection, people will not accept the lousy jobs. So you need to shift from welfare to workfare. But as you shift from welfare to workfare, you double down on your social insecurity and turbulence at the bottom of the class and spatial order. This creates a lot of social anxiety, which creates a deficit of legitimacy for, uh, for politicians. And how, so this, this, the creation of the disorders and turbulence at the bottom, this is something that was very well identified by Karl Polanyi in his book, The Great, uh, the, the Great Transformation. And since this is what I call the Karl Polanyi problem. How do you counter the disruptive effect of radical commodification? Well, in Karl Polanyi, it was the counter movement. You, you have unions, you have uh, uh, the society responds and rejects this dominance of the market. Here, the response comes within the state. It is the penal state that becomes the counter-movement that will contain the disorders and the disruption inside of the neighborhoods of relegation. And then you have what I call your Carl Schmitt problem. Now, Carl Schmitt is this political theorist who said the key problem of politics is to trace a boundary between the enemy, us and them, and to designate an enemy. What better policy to designate an enemy than to roll out the penal state and target them, the dark-skinned criminals, as the unworthy, threatening other that is the source of all the problems in the U.S. city. And so as you roll out your penal state, you resolve your Karl Polanyi problem, and you resolve your Karl Schmitt problem at the same time. But what you end up doing is further destabilizing these neighborhoods and creating a situation of sort of state-sponsored social insecurity and poverty at the heart of the inner city. So I'm going to conclude. I had a, uh, I skipped the argument about the, the uh, too bad. The, if, if you draw a portrait of social welfare recipients and a portrait of jail inmates, they're exactly identical, but for one variable. Your social welfare recipients are the women, and your, your jail inmates are the men, and it's the men of those women. That is, it is the girlfriends, the sisters, so of the same households. 
It's the same households. It's the same lineages. It's the same neighborhood that are being targeted by the two hands of the state, disciplinary workfare on the, on the left hand and, and expensive prison fare on the other hand, uh, destabilizing and maintaining the state on ongoing state-sponsored marginality. So let me come to the conclusion. Oh, I have to skip uh, all of this. Too bad. You, you, I'm just letting this for a second so that you can get a, ah, what you're missing. <laughs> but let me come... <laughs> Let me come to the conclusion. Um, to complete the agenda of the truly disadvantaged, we must bring the state back in as a core agency that determines the fate of the poor through the gamut of policies and particularly through the conjunction of disciplinary welfare policies and, and neutralizing uh, criminal justice policies. We must thus treat the state as a productive agency. The state produces and distributes marginality through the gamut of policies through which it sets the parameters of inequality and opportunity and then it reacts to the poverty that it has created paradoxically in particular through economic deregulation and social welfare retrenchment. Second, we must repatriate penal policy as a major force that generates life instability, aggravates inequality as Bruce Western has shown very well, deepens poverty and creates dishonor that further amputates the life options of those whom it processes. Thirdly, we must reconnect social policy and penal policy, work fair and prison fair, because they are trained on the same vulnerable populations, they use the same techniques, and they are now operate under the same philosophy of moral behaviorism. And fourthly, uh, we must recognize that the inner city or neighborhoods of relegation more generally, those districts where the marginal and stigmatized fraction of the post-industrial working class concentrate, these neighborhoods are the prime targets and proving ground where the neoliberal state is concretely being assembled, tried, and tested. And this neoliberal state has one peculiarity. It is a centaur state. It is a hybrid organizational entity with a liberal head mounted on a paternalist body. The neoliberal Leviathan practices laissez-faire and laissez-passer at the top of the class structure towards corporations and the upper class at the level of the causes of inequality, but then it turns out to be fiercely interventionist, authoritarian, paternalist, and punitive at the bottom when it comes to dealing with the destructive consequences of economic deregulation and the retraction of the social safety net for those at the lower end of the class and honor ladder. So 25 years after the truly disadvantaged, the inner city remains a strategic research site a la Robert Merton for probing the re-engineering of the state as it deals with the very poverty that the state has spawned and tries to resolve the sovereignty problem that it has generated for itself by shedding its historic mission of economic provision and social support. So we ought to return to the truly disadvantaged with a state in mind and the prison in tow. Thank you. Well, we've heard some tour de force, and I'm not going to be able to equal any of that. Uh, let me start by thanking Bill Wilson. I still remember the sense of delight I had at the opportunity to go to the University of Chicago when he was there and Ira was there. That Combination didn't last for very long, but it was very special. And, uh, you know, uh, Bill and I have shared students over the years, uh, a sense of engagement with many of the political issues, although I've not been a contributor to the ecological side uh, the, of, of Bill's uh, legacy. Um, and, uh, it remains ironic that I think we saw each other a lot more at Chicago and even after our, I was here and you were there than we have while we're here at this university, which tells us something. I'm not sure what. But. <laughs> I'm going to take off from a comment that Doug Massey made that we're at a pivotal moment. I mean, we've heard analyses on this panel of some very... Uh, long-term structural or cultural arguments that imply the enduring significance of race in American politics. But I'm struck as I look back over the decades at the transmutations within the enduring realities. 
and the fact that we are at, uh, in, 19, in 2012, at, at an extraordinarily ironic moment. I mean, we are at a moment where uh, a black president uh, we call him African American, and I guess he's really African American. <laughs> an African product. Uh, may well be reelected, re or perhaps not, but in one of the most uh, political, ideologically polarized elections in American history, where racial overtones are all over the place. I'm not sure how many of us. I know I didn't. I did not expect to see a major candidate for the presidency running um, deliberately false racial ads about welfare in 2012. Um, I mean, I'm not easy to surprise, but that one has been, it has been a bit of a surprise. And yet, Race is not just about black and white at this moment either, because as Doug Massey correctly pointed out, uh, it's about the tensions uh, of a large Latino population that um, includes people who are undocumented and in the imagination of conservative whites includes even more people who are undocumented. Um, so, um, I ask myself, how did we get to this kind of politics um, from a period where um, Bill was one of the leaders in advocating the possibility of a kind of universalistic politics that might rebuild the kind of uh, cross-racial and cross-class coalitions that lay behind um, at least a few moments of the breakthroughs in the 1960s, um, and which in a way lays behind Obama's election, and it will lay behind his re-election if that occurs. Um, let me just say that my sense of how policy and politics, and by politics I mean political and electoral coalitions that work through the institutions Ira Cass Nelson was talking about. My sense of the sequence of things is a little different from what Jennifer presented. Yes, the 1930s was a period of breakthroughs for policies that came to be universal, but they weren't universal at the beginning. They left out, because of the nature of the Democratic Party, uh, the occupations of, uh, that black people were in. Uh, and it's just that they were national creations, uh, here I mean Social Security in particular, that could over time evolve and be reworked into something that became genuinely a case of targeting within universalism. But that didn't happen until the 1960s and the 1970s. And it didn't happen until the time that Medicare was also passed. So uh, those two big periods of liberal policy breakthrough ended up concatenating, but not until the 60s and 70s, in the ways that created a kind of universal set of social supports for older Americans that downplayed racial divisions among older Americans and boosted low and lower middle income people relative to where they would have been without Social Security and Medicare. But it's not as if anybody planned that exact breakthrough at any given moment and passed it. It came to be. And by the time it came to be, it created a new division that also has racial and class overtones between the old and the young in America, and I think that generational division is the most important one in play in 2012. Uh, I mean, we have a situation in which older Americans can count on the most expensive and most supportive parts of American social provision 
and yet they have been mobilized, or at least they were in the year 2010, to fight against the next big breakthrough in American social policy if we're talking about scope and expense, and that's the Affordable Care Act of 2010. They were mobilized, particularly the white conservatives among them, on the grounds that it would give tax them or perhaps cut their programs to give to the moochers and the freeloaders. Now, in the research that Vanessa Williamson and I did on the Tea Party, where we did something that was at least new for me, we went out and talked <laughs> to Tea Partiers. <laughs> and that was an extraordinary experience for me. Uh, to actually go and observe the meetings in Arizona. I didn't go to Arizona, but Vanessa did. But, but Virginia, several parts of Virginia, various parts of New England. And to sit down in quiet, confidential, one-on-one -on -one meetings with people. That's where you find out what they really think. Uh, and that's where you hear the fear, the raw fear that grassroots Tea Party people feel about the racial, the immigration, and the generational changes. Because the moochers also include their own grandkids <laughs> who want college loans without having worked for it. Um, so I think we have to understand that the earlier waves of highly racial politics in the United States that to some degree resolved themselves into at least social provision for the elderly, that was not racialized. I think it's fair to say that Medicare and Social Security are not highly racialized in the way people understand them. They deliver more help to lower income people relative to the inputs, and those people include people of color. And they are not resented. In fact, my Tea Partiers told me at the grassroots, I mean, forget about Dick Army, that grassroots Tea Partiers love Social Security and Medicare. They think real Americans have worked for those programs and have earned them, and they never mentioned a black person who didn't deserve to get Social Security and Medicare. Never once, never even alluded to such a thing. But the idea that there might be undocumented immigrants, illegal immigrants, who were crowding into schools and hospitals and getting something they hadn't earned, that was what they were thinking about. Or young people getting something they hadn't earned. Or low-wage workers, who certainly in Virginia, it was pretty clear who those people were, who were getting something like food stamps that they didn't earn. That was very much on their mind. Now, I think we can understand how race then reverberates and concatenates with generational differences by understanding the playing out, the uneven generational playing out of these programs. But where do we get the part about welfare? I mean, that's pretty ironic because I think Bill Wilson assumed, and I know I did, that when you got to the point where you were defining welfare as something that was temporarily tied to getting prepared to do wage work, which, you know, there was a good reason to do that. I'm sorry, Loic, there was a good reason to do that by the 1990s because it had originally been a program for mothers who were to be paid to stay, be stay at home, and the population doesn't think mothers should stay at home anymore by the 1990s. So we did pass welfare reform. We created temporary assistance for needy families, which Joe Sass's research shows is enforced quite unevenly across racial lines, quite ruthlessly on black people and less ruthlessly on white low-income women. But it's nevertheless there and accepted at some level as a given. We combine that with the expansion of the Earned Income Tax Credit, which nobody's mentioned, but that's a very important redistributive program based on the idea of, of, of wage labor. Uh, and it looked as if that might begin to change the, the use of racially tinged charges about welfare. 
that had divided white and black working class people from one another for decades, from the 60s to the 90s. And maybe it would have if Al Gore had just gotten himself really elected, as he actually was elected. And maybe it would have if the financial crash and the Great Recession had not hit. But once you have a massive economic downturn, following, by the way, 30 years in which it's not true that most Americans are pulling away from the poor, the middle is being pulled down toward the poor the, in the income statistics I've seen. Real income growth for middle income people of all races has stalled out and it is the top that's pulling in the way and that top is the top 5% really or 10%. Those are the folks pulling away from everybody else. But when you pile on top of that kind of compression downward, causing people to be more and more on their own, more and more desperate, you pile on top of that a massive economic downturn which has hammered the middle and the bottom, not the top, uh, by the time we get to 2011 and 2012. That opens the door for the kind of profoundly manipulative politics that ought to scare everybody in this room. The people behind the campaign ads that are using racial illusions about welfare or racial illusions about affordable care helping them at the expense of you if you're a Medicare, those people are billionaires and millionaires who are trying their best to break any sense of solidarity with all Americans of the middle and the lower income strata, and they want to destroy Medicare and Social Security too. So it's a moment that's very tenuous because it could go either way in this election. Not because Obama's great. He hasn't done much about poverty beyond the Affordable Care Act which is the most redistributive social program passed in 40 years. But the alternative will, well, I guess it'll, it'll leave the possibility of dealing with urban poverty so far toward the edges because it'll impose a new kind of poverty on the vast majority of Americans uh, if uh, the radicalized, the truly radicalized and very racialized Republican Party that's in the field right now manages to win everything in November. So that's how I look at it, and <laughs> I think it's a pivotal moment, and I hope everybody pays attention. Well, uh, I think the only... Uh, <laughs> Should have had me go first so there could be more cheerful things. <laughs> I was going to say, the only thing, uh, the only thing uh, worse than following uh, Jennifer R. and Loic is following uh, Jennifer R. and Loic and Theta. Um, I'm sort of in Larry's boat. I wasn't sure if I was going to say anything uh, today, but then, you know, I'm up here, so what the hell? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, and I, I will be optimistic. Why not? Last panel of the day. I think we've had uh, quite an incredible day, actually. Um, oh my goodness, that's my drama. I've just lost it. Okay. Um, so I want, you know, these uh, personal notes that are not off the clock are getting us into trouble, uh, but, uh, or that are off the clock are getting us into trouble. Uh, but let me take mine. Uh, We've heard today from many people that uh, Bill is uh, certainly an intellectual inspiration. Uh, he's certainly a, a personal inspiration. It's, it's just absolutely remarkable and striking to me how beloved he is among uh, his uh, friends and students and colleagues. So uh, I, I would want to add to this... Uh, uh, that he's a political inspiration 
uh, as well. He is an extraordinary model, I think, of how uh, sober analysis, careful theorizing, and the highest empirical standards uh, can be uh, applied uh, with a, a real sense of uh, uh, social relevance and uh, political engagement. And I think that has to be our project for the students in this room, for the scholars in this room. Uh, the, that has to be uh, our project as well. I remember reading The Truly Disadvantaged, my first year of graduate school in 1987 in New York City. I uh, had just moved to the United States and knew nothing uh, about American society, and I read The Truly Disadvantaged in the first <laughs> semester of graduate school. And, uh, and, and there were two amazing things in the, uh, the book for me. The central importance of, uh, of full employment and... Uh, the, the central importance of uh, universalistic social <coughs> policy. And I read this and thought, ah, oh, geez, this guy's a Swedish social democrat. This was instantly recognisable to me uh, as a politics. Yes, but um, we don't use those words in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> um, so let me, uh, uh, let me talk a bit about... Uh, 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 policy politics, and as I say, I'll try and be optimistic. Um, so the employment problems of prime age men uh, were at the centre uh, of the truly uh, disadvantaged. Uh, these were men who were tenuously uh, attached to legitimate employment. They hung out in public places. Uh, they were exposed to and involved in very high rates of uh, violence. Uh, they became involved in uh, urban and outdoor uh, drug markets in the absence of uh, legitimate uh, economic opportunities. So they were, in short, uh, a political problem, these men, uh, the men of the truly disadvantaged. Uh, these were men for whom uh, there was no social policy. The solution we adopted, as Loic described, uh, was also deeply, deeply uh, political. Uh, we reformed the penal codes, uh, we massively increased prison admission rates, uh, and uh, we uh, massively increased time served uh, in prison. Uh, I'm going to show one slide. Normally I show a ton of slides. I'm going to show uh, one slide uh, in this talk. And I think there are two things uh, that we need to know about mass incarceration uh, in America as we think of uh, the policy solution that was adopted for this problem population of prime age men uh, in America's inner cities. And this is the first thing we need to know, though we have no projector. Can you just tell us about it? No, no. We're... Ah, there we go. Okay. So... Um, uh, these are figures showing uh, lifetime risks of imprisonment. This is uh, the chances of going to prison uh, for men uh, who were born in the late 1940s. Okay? And so these guys are reaching their mid-30s uh, in 1979, uh, before uh, the big increase uh, in uh, penal populations and... Uh, uh, as the, uh, the, the problems of the jobless ghetto uh, are unfolding. And uh, we can see that there's a racial difference in uh, the risk of imprisonment. And for uh, African-American men born in the late 1940s, uh, one in eight would go to prison in their lifetime. And so we're talking about state or federal prison. This is 28 months of time served at the median. These figures vastly understate people's contact with the criminal justice system because it doesn't count uh, probation, uh, doesn't count uh, jail incarceration. So one in eight African-American uh, men were serving time in prison uh, at some point in their lives uh, before the great run-up uh, in the prison population. Uh, if we were to compare these guys to another birth cohort that were born in the late 1970s that are reaching their mid-30s uh, right now, uh, their lifetime risks of That's going... Very being optimistic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where's the optimism? <laughs> where's the optimism? Yeah. Uh, trust me, it gets better, I hope. Uh, uh, and so what are, what are we seeing here? That for uh, African-American men who have dropped out of high school, 
uh, right? These, uh, this is the core of the truly disadvantaged. Their lifetime risk of going to prison now, a statistic that vastly understates contact with the criminal justice system, their lifetime risk of going to prison uh, is about 70%. So going to prison has become an entirely normal thing in the life course uh, uh, of these men. Okay, this is where we're at. But we're also at uh, a reform moment. For the first time in uh, 35 years in, uh, in criminal justice policy, and, uh, and so it's interesting to think, what would it take to take advantage of this moment, uh, uh, moment of uh, melting punitive sentiment? Uh, and I could talk more about the origins of it, but, uh, uh, but time is short. And I, I think it's interesting to think about the reform potential of criminal justice policy because it's a real hard case. Right? It's dealing with the most marginal, the most dishonoured, and apparently the least deserving uh, of, the, uh, of the population. And if there's a reform possibility uh, there, uh, then we might be encouraged uh, about other, other spheres. So what are the values that underpin an institution uh, like this? And I think at its core, uh, mass incarceration is governed by a philosophy of criminality uh, as moral failure. And in this moral universe, there are two classes of people, basically. There are offenders and victims. And the job of the penal system is to keep victims safe uh, from offenders. And so the prison is the guardian of public safety. Uh, but the idea of public safety uh, here is very thin. The idea of public safety under mass incarceration is very thin. From what are the public made safe? In the imagination of the policymakers, the full legitimate violence of the state is being applied to keep decent people safe from the wicked and the opportunistic, uh, as James Q. Wilson might say. Uh, the offenders are strangers to us, as Loic was uh, saying. They're an alien group. They're marked by their permanent criminality. And the language of criminal threat uh, is one of racialized uh, invasion. Uh, by those who lack full moral capacity and, as, as Glenn Lowry has argued, uh, may be lacking their full humanity in the imagination of policymakers. So public safety, in this very thin sense, is solved through social division. If you're not dealing with people with problems, uh, but with problem people, they've got to be segregated from the rest of us. So part of the project uh, of a reform, reform uh, politics of criminal justice is to try and think about well, what, would, what, would an alternative, uh, what would an alternative set of values look like? Uh, what would be the alternative to this thin public safety, uh, which is the objective of mass incarceration? Um, and we've come to a really interesting point, right? Because within the moral universe of mass incarceration, prison time seems deeply, deeply natural. Uh, what other solution to the problem of crime uh, could we conceive? Uh, you do the crime, you do the time. And no matter that no other modern democracy has gone down this path, offenders have to be negated by incarceration. So to motivate reform, we could contrast the thin public safety of mass incarceration uh, with what I'm thinking of as a thick public safety, a thick public safety of social citizenship. So in this view, the common welfare flourishes uh, where people have order, predictability and stability uh, in everyday life. And under these conditions, people can imagine a future for themselves, uh, invest in their children. Criminal victimisation represents just one of a whole variety of threats alongside unemployment, poor health, financial insecurity and so on. And our exposure to risk uh, stems not from bad people, uh, but from bad situations for which we're uh, poorly prepared. This is what sort of an alternative, uh, uh, an alternative normative framework uh, that might underpin a, a more progressive uh, criminal justice politics. Uh, so a thick public safety is uh, preventive, not reactive, uh, and it aims to limit our exposure uh, to risk. When hazards arise, which is an actuarial certainty, victims are restored through uh, insurance. Uh, so a thick public safety, the idea of it uh, is to uh, erase the bright line that distinguishes victims and offenders. It's integrative, not divisive. Uh, we acknowledge that uh, 
Uh, offenders in one situation, in many cases, have been victims uh, in others. Uh, and more than this, right, in communities where 70% uh, of the young men are going to prison, maybe if we lived there too, we'd go to prison too, right? Uh, as people with problems and not problem people, offender and victim are only temporary roles in this normative framework of thick public safety. And so neither offender nor victim are disqualified from the restorative effects uh, of social policy. So what policies are we talking about? A whole variety of things are on the table at the moment. There's a very lively uh, reform uh, conversation and it's going to be worked out differently in different places. Uh, but this value of a thick public safety sees little progressive potential in imprisonment. Incarceration has to be sparing, deferring to the robust application of social policy from early child intervention through universal health care uh, with mental health parity. This isn't some pie in the sky, this is exactly where uh, current policy uh, debates uh, are now focused. So I think, uh, uh, I think this is uh, a very right moment in many ways. Now the great weakness of this proposal uh, for a thick public safety uh, is that it fails to speak to the outrage of those aggrieved by crime and disorder. So the balm applied to this outrage, th that's punishment's great cultural contribution to social cohesion. Uh, and this was a lesson, I think, that was missed by the left in the 1960s as Goldwater and uh, then Nixon were making law and order a central plank uh, of the conservative platform. Uh, outrage and anxiety, though, uh, are not spontaneous responses to crime, uh, they're politically produced uh, to an important degree. Um, and political context helped define exactly what it is people are anxious about. An alternative conversation about criminal justice has the potential uh, to redefine public anxiety and redefine the public's, uh, the public's understanding of crime. So what politics, what specific uh, political efforts could be made uh, to advance the cause of uh, thick public safety. This is where the optimism uh, comes in. Uh, I think a, a successful uh, reform politics is going to have four main elements. If it happens, it's, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, first, the great progressive programs in the United States historically involve uh, policy experts in government and academia and activists from civil rights and labour movements. Right now, the political movement uh, for criminal justice reform is very local, it's very inchoate. Uh, service providers who run local programs uh, are among the leading activists. Uh, at the national level, the largest reform effort is uh, Council on State Government uh, and their Justice Reinvestment uh, Project. This is a technical effort, uh, it's aimed at cutting correctional budgets through parole reform. Uh, they're talking a little bit about social programming, a little bit about social policy, particularly drug treatment. Uh, but uh, policy makers are mostly attuned to cutting correctional budgets uh, rather than uh, expanding uh, uh, social policy efforts. Uh, so political will for significant reform, and this came up a number of times in, in the discussion. I thought it was, uh, I, I agreed 100%. Uh, Pat said it and uh, Jennifer uh, said it. We're not missing uh, uh, good answers necessarily. We're, we're missing political will. And I think that's absolutely true uh, in the criminal justice case. It, 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 it's quite obvious actually what to do and what a more uh, rational criminal justice policy would look like. So political will for significant reform is going to require uh, the two pillars of uh, progressive politics in America. Uh, the civil rights movement and the labour movement. Uh, criminal justice reform is barely on the radar of civil rights groups and it's not at all uh, salient for unions. Uh, an AWOL civil rights establishment is the central message of Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow and as remote as mass incarceration is uh, for civil rights organisation, it currently falls outside Labor's purview, who have nevertheless been strong supporters of anti-poverty policy and health care reform. Uh, so two, uh, two policy domains uh, which have uh, significantly, uh, uh, significantly uh, helped this uh, very same population who are at greatest risk of incarceration. Uh, so that's going to have to change. Uh, second, the vanguard 
uh, of the Tough on Crime movement is staffed by prosecutors, victims' rights advocates, uh, and occasionally uh, police. Leaders in all three groups uh, will have to commit to reform. Uh, for police and prosecutors, the tough on crime perspective is deeply woven into their uh, professional identity. So I think a key task is trying to redefine the professional identity of uh, uh, prosecutors, uh, prosecutors and cops. Uh, how do we do this? Here's one example. Uh, through a series of executive sessions in policing uh, at Harvard that dated from the early 1980s, a new professional role was defined for big city police chiefs. Maybe we can do this too uh, for, uh, for prosecutors, uh, in which their uh, professional identity would be redefined as uh, community advocates. Third thing we have to do uh, uh, involves uh, trying to find bipartisan consensus uh, uh, among elected officials. Punitive policy commanded uh, bipartisan consensus. Democrats uh, helped expand prison populations. Uh, reversing mass incarceration will also involve left-right coalitions. There are signs of openness among Republicans to less punitive policy. Conservative libertarians opposed the drug war. Uh, Christian conservatives have spoken out against penal severity, inspired by a uh, moral philosophy of redemption. Redemption, that's a real political uh, opportunity. Finally, uh, because the current has, uh, the punitive current has flowed so strongly in one direction over the last 30 years, I think pol uh, activists have to be opportunistic and pluralistic, and they have to take their supporters and their arguments where they can find them. The tough on crime movement uh, was not particularly coherent and it brought together policy entrepreneurs uh, from across the political spectrum, and the counter movement has to do uh, counter movement has to do likewise. There's a big inside baseball discussion uh, among the criminal justice uh, policy people. Should we only talk about uh, cutting correctional budgets and public safety, or could we possibly talk about racial justice uh, as well? And the answer is. Yes, there are some audiences to whom you can talk about racial justice and uh, for whom that will, uh, uh, that will gain some traction, uh, but clearly there are others in which uh, uh, public safety and uh, cutting correctional costs will be paramount and uh, uh, reformers have to be uh, opportunistic in that way. So the window on criminal justice reform is now opening for the first time. Uh, and the system took 35 years to grow. It's going to take uh, a long time uh, to shrink. Uh, policy change is possible, uh, but the politics are extremely uh, fragile. Here's an example. Uh, December 2010, 57-year-old uh, parolee Dominic uh, Sinelli uh, was ser serving uh, concurrent life sentences for armed robbery. He killed a police officer uh, in a shootout in Woburn. Uh, as a result, the parole board was fired. A prosecutor was uh, appointed as the new director of parole. Parole release has essentially stopped in Massachusetts. Uh, and the state's first African-American governor uh, just signed into law a new three strikes enhancement, eliminating parole for third time uh, felons. Um, a broad coalition that can share political risk and who are invested in the humanity of those entangled in the criminal justice system can stand fast against retrograde policy that's urged in the heat of freak crimes. This is a structural problem for this policy uh, domain. More than this, such a coalition, I think, can redefine criminality to manage in other ways, in non-criminal justice ways, the social fallout of addiction, mental illness, and acute poverty uh, among uh, poor men. Uh, the truly disadvantaged offers a fundamentally important uh, message here. I think universalistic uh, social policy uh, will be absolutely important, uh, in part uh, because it's a, a way of including in a beneficiary pool uh, those who are often despised uh, uh, in the uh, political conversation. Uh, and such measures are also, universalistic measures, are also resistant to rollback uh, and backlash. Uh, in the clear cases of predatory violence, fraud or criminal negligence, our coalition for a thick public safety, uh, I'd hope, can dull the impulse for retribution. 
So we're in an election year and it, it's uh, pitting a very moderate uh, Democratic Party uh, against the Tea Party. Uh, and so reversing mass incarceration may seem uh, a low priority uh, for our political leaders. Uh, still, if there is a path to meaningful reform, this is what I think it's going to look like. This is what I think it has to look like, actually. Uh, and uh, more than that, for criminal justice policy, which is really uh, this phantom social policy, right, to uh, address the problems of this population for which there is no other social policy. So uh, for, for criminal justice policy, uh, change is in the air. So let me close there and uh, open the floor to questions for the last time. Barry. Uh, Barry Bluestone, and I think this is probably to Ira and Theta. Um, let me propose a modest, uh, a modest proposal with uh, apologies to Jonathan Swift. Um, if you look at the polls on almost all the issues we've been talking about here, there is a major split by race and gender. So my modest proposal is a modest change in the United States Constitution to eliminate the franchise for white men. <laughs> um, my impression is that there is a, uh, a gender issue here as well as a racial issue. And then I think it gets to some of the issues of fear, worries about where this country's going in terms of its racial and ethnic uh, demographics, uh, fears of, in a down economy of what this means in terms of competition for jobs. And it appears to me uh, that there is a significant number of white men who feel that their world is under attack. Sure. Is that fair? Yeah, you know, I think it is, Barry, but they're not deluding themselves. Um, they've had a tough time of it for the last uh, 30 years, um, especially non-college uh, white men or men with just a little bit of college and they're dealing with changes in the family and gender roles that are deeply disturbing uh, to them. Um, I'm struck when I listen to Bruce, for example, that I, I spend quite a bit of time in Maine and West Virginia. Now, those are both white, poor areas. And um, a lot of the things that we're describing as the pathologies of inner cities uh, are going on there, including the sending to prison of more and more yeah. young men and now even some young women on drug crimes. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that's not going to open up new, new issues uh, or new possibilities for rethinking those crimes, not all crimes, but those, those crimes. But I just think you're right. Uh, there is a gender dimension to it. I don't think it's as strong as the age and the racial divisions if we're talking about the polls and how people vote. But I also want to inject a little bit of optimism. Most Americans are not buying the racial nonsense that's being sold from the right in this election. And that even includes white men who have moved toward Obama in the last month, despite the tough economy. Yes, since the Democratic Convention, and Bill Clinton speaking out was pretty important to the you know the Bubba factor there. Um, the offering of an, a, an economic narrative about what this is, what has happened here, and where we're going, which Obama never offered uh, to anybody. Uh, so. I mean, and, and if we're taking something like felon disenfranchisement, which is a big deal in the political system, I mean, we've, we've seen a systematic effort to disenfranchise the young and minorities who don't have the, quote, right IDs, which is clearly a political rollback of voting rights. Um, but the majority of Americans, as Christopher Uggins' research shows, don't support that. They don't support that, and that includes white people too, not just minorities. Uh, if I could add a footnote, the, um, you know, the politics of the 60s, um, a, a kind of cultural politics, civil rights politics, gender politics, um, 
was in, uh, developed in a circumstance where it was widely thought um, that the basic economic conundrums of boom and had bust been had been solved. Daniel that, Bell wrote a book saying that. That, that you economists um, uh, knew how to um, uh, manipulate variables so as to smooth things out and, and not bring us back to, to situations of, uh, of, of, of crises. And, but in, in our lifetimes, um, uh, it, what's, what seems to me quite remarkable is that um, the, the gender revolution, the um, a gay rights revolution, and a, um, uh, and, 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 and a civil rights revolution um, uh, that originated in some sense in that period of the era of the 60s, despite fierce countercurrents and often violent resistance, um, uh, has, taken, has taken hold. That's my leading ground for optimism. Um, there, there is not a majority of Americans to be mobilized simply on the basis of opposing that. Even on gay rights, the Absolutely majority not. of Americans now minimally support civil unions, for example. Um, uh, the, and the Republican Party has actually moved, as, is very shy and reserved about making uh, some of those issues big national issues. Um, the opportunity, it seems to me, um, is for an articulation of a language of fairness that includes economic fairness um, coupled to social and cultural fairness. And we have yet to see um, a, a powerful enough articulation of what that would, w w would mean. But I do think that opportunity is there. Um, and it's waiting to be seized. And it has um, generational advantages, demographic possibilities, um, given transformations in American life. Um, which in some sense are better than they've been in a long time. But um, that makes even more makes this election result this um, so uh, pivotal, pivotal because we may see in one result um, a fairly radical social policy agenda um, uh, put into law with a unified um, uh, government, um, whereas <laughs> it, um, uh, on the other side with a re-election, um, I don't think you'll see uh, equally a profound kinds of changes as the Affordable Care Act actually does provide. Um, but you will see the, the creation of a, of a time span where this kind of politics of fairness could develop really robustly, bottom up as well as top, top down. The Affordable Care Act will survive, which in and of itself is a major change. We're all talking too much. Survives. Um, I know we're under a real uh, time pressure at the moment. It, maybe we could uh, collect uh, a couple and, uh, and then the panel could respond. Thanks. I'd just like to thank the organizers. My name is Brandon Moore, by the way. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Um, this has been a phenomenal day. Um, I just had a question for uh, Professor Western. Um, I'm very interested. Uh, first of all, I was surprised to learn that I had a 20% chance of being in jail, so that was informative. But um, <laughs> But um, actually, it, uh, it was striking that um, what you said, the numbers actually understated um, the real problem in terms of the fact that it didn't cover um, people who were uh, had contact through uh, probation and were jailed. Um, I'm interested in, in, in addressing that problem, but uh, how, what sources would be useful in terms of um, sussing out the actual numbers of people that have had contact with the criminal justice system because the, the impacts are, are the same. You, you still get a felony whether you go to jail or prison or just are on probation. So. We, can, we can definitely talk about that. Okay. I think... Uh, oh, there is a question. Oh, Rick. Yeah, just to get back to Eric, that's an open point about politics of fairness. And it seems to me that um, uh, the truly disadvantaged was a language or led to a language of a politics of a exploitation at a period following the 1960s when a language of inclusion and exclusion tended to dominate. Who's in and who's out. And, but including people in a society that is deeply unequal to begin with, it seems to me, requires a different kind of politics of fairness um, or of exploitation. The problem with that is that there's a history of excluding that language in the American political culture. Uh, partly going back to the Cold War. So I, 
don't know if there's a question, but it was, it, it's just an appreciation of uh, the truly disadvantaged for opening, which we never took full advantage of, as we're talking about, um, a, the possibility of a politics of exploitation across, across classes, across race. And Rick's point isn't uh, a bad one on which, uh, on which to close. Um, I think we've had a really extraordinary day, which uh, is only fitting for a celebration of a, a really extraordinary scholar. And uh, I thank all of you in, in joining us in uh, uh, recognising the 25th anniversary of uh, the truly disadvantaged. I thank Bill for writing such uh, a historic work. Thank you.